The topic of my presentation is securitizations of identity politics in contemporary world. I would like to uh, analyze some terms, trends of these politics and interpretation because they are very different. Uh, we start from, from the terms. Uh, the first question is how what is the connection between identity and security? Uh, if you look at the world uh, politics and world policy theories, uh, you know that the Copenhagen School first introduces the question of identity to international security theory. We can remember also Raymond Aron, who wrote a lot on the uh, connection between identity and international relations, identity and security, both national and international. Uh, on the other hand, there is a different uh, interpretation of what is identity politics. And uh, uh, in social sciences and political science also, uh, the identity politics uh, still be interpreted uh, as the uh, activity uh, defended of oppressed minorities. And I choose uh, illustrations, pictures for my presentation uh, in order to uh, visualize the different approach. This is, I think that it's a strong visualization what is oppressed minorities and what is the identity politics as the course on the defense of these minorities, of these groups uh, by different colors and uh, um, sex and uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but uh, during the last decade, the new understanding and the new interpretations of identity politics spread. Uh, and there is in some um, gap between public discourse and academic discourse. Because uh, if uh, in academic discourse, this um, classical understanding of identity politics as the defense course um, uh, still exists, but uh, in political discourse, a public discourse, the new understanding of identity politics. Uh, and it uh, depends on the activity of politicians, political leaders. Probably the most of them um, declare the principle, it's my country, is it right or wrong? It's American uh, sentence and uh, very often, people rem don't remember that it's some prolongations of this sentence. It's my country is right or wrong. If my country is right, I support it. And if my country is wrong, I correct it. But uh, politicians don't remember, and it, it is not interesting for them to continue this sentence. So it's my country, is it right or wrong? It's identity politics. Uh, and the answers on the questions, who are we? And who are, who are they? Uh, are they our uh, opponents or are they our enemies, uh, potential or real enemies? Uh, so the strong connection between identity and securitization, security, uh, we look that it's the trend of our days, nowadays. So the new interpretations of identity politics uh, is the activity targeted to the creation and legitimation of the nation state identity. In Russian political science, uh, um, Professor Semenenko uh, proposed this sentence, this approach, and uh, during last years, a lot of publications were made uh, according to this uh, understanding and this interpretation of, of identity politics. And it's possible to say that securitization puts the category of identity in the context of international security, uh, when identity politics could be used as a soft power element on foreign policy tool. And we can uh, find in uh, contemporary interpretations of identity politics that it's really a soft power uh, or that it's some kind um, uh, of, uh, not, not of course hard power, but very strict uh, uh, course. Uh, I'd like to say some words on the new politics of memory and identity in this uh, classical understanding 
understanding of identity politics. It's a huge uh, area of uh, study. It's a huge area of discussion, sometimes very hot discussions, uh, this new politics memory and identity. And I propose you to look just for several signs of this new politics, uh, which uh, illustrate, uh, illustrate wars of memory, wars of monuments, BLM and mnemonic warriors, uh, wars of memory connect, are connected with wars of monuments. For example, uh, you, you you know, I, I, I'm sure that you know this uh, monument uh, to Winston Churchill, and it was uh, uh, written that uh, Churchill, Churchill was a racist, but you, you couldn't uh, find these monuments now. They didn't exist uh, more. Uh, Avram Lincoln monument, uh, Christopher Columbus monument, because they were replaced, they were um, uh, they were destroyed, destroyed uh, according to this new wars of memory, because all of these people, uh, both both of them were. Uh, interpreted as uh, racist and so uh, not necessary to keep their monument. So no, no monument, only some photo on them. Uh, and uh, probably you know that uh, there is a new course uh, in, in the USA to change the design of uh, US dollar. Uh, and uh, also there is some discussion uh, uh what, what 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 necessary to do and the decision was made that these uh, 20 dollars banknote uh, should be made uh, change the des uh, design from uh, Andrew Jackson who was the seventh president of the USA uh, who was a general who fought against Indians and who uh, American Indians, I mean, and who was uh, uh, owner of self. So, so uh, no, no Andrew Jackson more. Probably Alex Alexis de Tocqueville uh, would be very glad because he hated Andrew Jackson. Uh, Tocqueville in his Democracy of America uh, declared that uh, uh, Jackson is the worst uh, person for the presidency, but only the good political system um, helps uh, America to keep democracy. And uh, Jackson will be replaced by Tubman. Tubman, uh, who was a, a female activist uh, and fighter against uh, uh, self-free. The secretization of memory politics uh, strongly connected with the memory on the Second World War. And we can look that the uh, picture is very different, the understanding uh, of the result of the war and the participants of the war. According to Gallup data, in uh, 1945, 60% of Europeans considered that uh, the USSR, Soviet Union, played a key role in the victory over fascism. In 2015, 60% of respondents thought it was the USA. And I choose also uh, these different pictures, like visualization of these uh, different pictures of memory of memory on this event, uh, uh, Soviet soldiers in Berlin, uh, or uh, a light landing in Normandy. Normandy, it's different pictures and different understanding, different interpretations of the of the war of the um, winners, especially USA or USSR. Uh, if we look uh, on the another side uh, of this uh, pact uh, during the Second World War, 70% uh, of Japanese school children answered that Japan was a victim in the Second World War. Uh, why they answer, uh, answered uh, such way? Uh, uh, Partly it's because of the politics of uh, Ministry of Education in uh, Japan, because not possible to use in school texts, school books uh, in on history in Japan, to use terms like aggression 
uh, in respect of Japan, nothing about uh, Nanking events when 70,000 of uh, Chinese people were killed by Japanese soldiers, uh, only a few words on uh, Pearl Harbor, uh, but a lot uh, about of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So Hiroshima and Nagasaki replaced in collective memory the memory on the uh, Japanese aggression uh, before and during the Second World War. Uh, the targeted course uh, of memory politics is to rewrite history and to construct a new identity. Uh, why? For what purpose? The purpose is evident. It's uh, the purpose to legitimate the status of the country in contemporary world. Uh, if the country is not uh, uh, winning, so not, not necessary to be proud, uh, uh, I mean, the USSR. If uh, the country is victim, so not necessary to be ashamed for the crimes during the Second World War. Not, uh, not so rarely the uh, rewriting of history, the alternative uh, politics of memory and alternative politics of um, identity has some pragmatic um, pragmatic motivation and, and incentives. Uh, and uh, um, historians and political scientists consider that it's uh, true regarding the Eastern European countries, because Eastern European countries um, have a very strange and strong feelings. Uh, even uh, one of uh, American journalists, Francis Tapen, uh, entitled his work, work uh, his book on the Eastern Europe um, as Hidden Europe. Hidden Europe. Why Hidden Europe? Because nobody wants uh, to be interpreted as Eastern Europe. Eastern Europe is a loser in the Cold War. Uh, so it's necessary to rewrite, rewrite history, rewrite collective memory. And uh, for the Eastern European country, countries, especially Poland and then Baltic countries, uh, there is some representations of the countries as the victims of two totalitarian regimes, Nazi and Soviet. Uh, and it connected with the refusal to regard the Holocaust as central to the memory of the atrocities during the Second World War. Uh, and uh, uh, this victimism uh, had, has a result to demand to equate Nazism and communism. As you know, the European Commission, the European Parliament uh, agreed to do this and made several uh, documents with uh, equitation, nazism, and communism. Uh, and the another point of this victimism as a, a course of identity politics is uh, refusal to admit responsibilities for crimes during the war. Uh, for example, Viktor Orban, uh, the prime um, Victorian, oh, sorry, uh, Hungarian uh, politician and leader of Hungary. <coughs> explained the uh, participation of Hungary uh, in the Second World War on the territory of the Soviet Union. Uh, he told that Hungarian troops on the Don River, uh, south of Russia, uh, they uh, played the role of, of the uh, bastion against communism. They, um, they fought against communism attack uh, in Europe. Uh, and the, another uh, thing, another result of this victimism uh, identity politics is uh, the claim of compensation from old Europe, uh, which suffers, suffered less than Eastern Europe. And it's evident since the enlargement of the European Union in 2004, uh, this uh, claim of compensation and Poland um, uh, received a lot uh, in this course and as a result of uh, its policy and including identity politics. 
uh, I would like to show you uh, some pictures from Liberty Square in Budapest, Hungary, as visualization of uh, alternative memory politics. Uh, you can uh, see this, uh, the monument to Soviet soldiers liberators, it's uh, um, common for uh, uh, socialist or Western European, Eastern European countries uh, policy. Uh, and then uh, the, on the right side of this uh, monument, right there, there, they have something there, the bust of Horsey, who was Hitler's, uh, Hitler's ally uh, and uh, dictator, famous Hungarian dictators. And the very interesting monument was established in 2014. Monuments to the victims of German occupation. You know that this uh, lady, woman, is a Hungary, and this uh, all as a uh, awful Germany who tried to attack this poor, poor, nice Hungary. And it's interesting story. I uh, I read it. Uh, uh, in the article of uh, one of the uh, Hungarian historian who uh, uh, entitled his uh, article as Liberty Square in Identity Politics of Hungary. Uh, and, and he described that this monument was prepared, um, was prepared outside the, some public uh, discussion, no public discussion, no, no plans of, of this monument. And it was uh, placed, established uh, it's one of the night in May 2014. And there is some uh, reaction of people, feedback of people. You look this and this. Uh, this some human agonized memorial, uh, informal memorial. Uh, there, there are some um, photos uh, of victims, people who were killed during the Second World War, during Horthy's uh, regime. Uh, there, their letters, uh, candles, uh, flowers in honor, uh, in memory of these people. So only one square and uh, complexity of memories, complexities and even struggle of um, uh, identity politics. Uh, identity and international relations has a lot of uh, dimensions and one of the probably most prominent now in our today situation, China. The China dream became an official slogan in 2012. Xi Jinping in 2014 declared that to realize the China dream, the uh, China needs to enhance its national cultural soft power. Uh, soft power of China, but you know that the very strong feelings of American politicians and analysts regarding China and New York analysts called uh, soft power of China the sharp power of China, and uh, there is some uh, illustration also the journal of economist sharp power of China, so not so soft power. Uh, as uh, Xi Jinping, uh, China dream appeals to a combination of traditional China and social modernity, especially uh, the China model of development and Confucian civilization. So civilizational features, uh, civilization, science, and uh, socialist slogans, socialist purposes of contemporary China. Uh, the revival of the Chinese nation implies the clear goal of making China great again. The slogan to make country great, great to make country great again. It's a very popular slogan for uh, political leaders in contemporary world. Uh, the identity politics of China includes the opposition to Cold War era. Uh, zero sum thinking policies, expansionism, hegemonism and power politics. And Xi Jinping uh, proposed instead of it the promotion of comprehensive, common and cooperative security architecture for Asia and for the world. Discussing 
uh, identity politics of China, the identity politics of America, uh, it, it, even different kinds of dream, uh, publicists um, consider that China and the US are involved in a Cold War style battle of the American dream versus the China dream. <coughs> Uh, the Trump administration has uh, identified China as a revisionist power and rival seeking to shape a world antithetical to US values and interest. Uh, please note that values first and then interest, although, of course, we can understand that uh, vice versa, interest is the uh, are the first and values the second. Anyway, uh, values is some kind of justification for interests. The plan of uh, Xi Jinping for the great re rejuvenation of the Chinese nation uh, is a global power with certain system of values. Global power with glo uh, global power with global thinking. Global power is a socialist system of values. Uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, American politicians use uh, China as some um, argument against each other. For example, you look this uh, attack of Biden on China uh, and a set of measures against China. Uh, at the same time, um, in uh, electoral propaganda, uh, uh, Trump administration, not administration, Trump team used uh, the uh, China and Xi Jinping as uh, some argument uh, against Biden, that uh, Joe Biden is a Chinese puppet. You look at this, uh, Trump. Um, uh, advertisement, political advertisement. Joe Biden, in his uh, first speeches, um, declares China is a formidable authoritarian adversary, methodically strengthening its capabilities to steal intellectual property, repress its own people, uh, bully its neighbors, expand its global reach, and build influence in American society. And if you uh, listen his uh, recent speech for uh, European Union on the summit of the European Union, uh, he um, agreed that Xi Jinping is a clever man. Yes, he is a clever man, but he, but, but he believes in autocracy. But he, he thinks that autocracy is the future of mankind. Uh, and he didn't, doesn't believe in democracy. So it's, it's a sin of Xi Jinping. Um, and it's uh, very close to the American uh, exceptionalism, American identity and exceptionalism. One of the um, prominent American scholars, one of the prominent researchers of identity and identity politics, Samuel Huntington, um, in his book, uh, Who Are We? on the American uh, national identity, uh, declared that American identity has been based historically upon race, ethnicity, religion, culture, and ideology. No, this term was white, Anglo-Saxon, um, Protestant, and of course, men. Um, and American exceptionalism um, leads to U U.S. foreign policy acting in a missionary fashion, lead the United States to assume that the rest of the world desires the values that the U.S. itself upholds. So uh, it's some uh, consideration and some belief and justification on foreign policy. Uh, I. Uh, preparing to this presentation, I have looked at uh, recent publications, articles of uh, the American researchers and Russian and Chinese also. And uh, the most of uh, the authors uh, emphasize that US state representation as the leader of the West, 
with corresponding rights and responsibilities, and that it's one of the reasons why American public opinion accepts costly uh, military intervention abroad and the active military post uh, in general. Uh, researchers compare the politics of Trump's with previous course of foreign policy and with the uh, new uh, position of Joe Biden. And there are, of course, some differences. Trump American first foreign policy gave a sense of odd to the United States foreign policy universe by rejecting the post-war consensus of extending a globalist ideology. Um, uh, Trump uh, was sure that necessary to concentrate uh, to focus on the uh, domestic power uh, and domestic policy in order to make America strong. And when America uh, became become uh, more strong, it's possible to return to this uh, America first foreign policy. Political justification of exceptionalist uh, uh, spread uh, through the uh, politicians of different political orientation, uh, different uh, party partisanship. Uh, liberals advocate US uh, primacy and NATO expansion as essential for preserving the global institutional order and promoting democracy. Uh, Biden explained in 2020, no other nation had that capacity. Uh, neoconservative neocons and hegemonic realists, the other uh, kind of politicians, defend US military primacy as a view uh, it is an essential foundation of American national security. Uh, neocons go even further than realists by insisting that the United States cannot be fully secure without transforming other states, such as Russia, in particular, uh, in the image of American democracy. I don't know, uh, remember, do you remember or not, it was very popular uh, advertisement uh, uh, during uh, Bush younger. George, George Bush, that uh, do you believe in, in democracy? If not, we become to you with our missiles, with our rockets, with our weapon. Uh, American exceptionalism, uh, legitimate foreign policy, and uh, I um, propose you uh, to, I think, very clear. Uh, citation of uh, two presidents, previous Donald Trump and, and uh, recent uh, Joe Biden. <clears throat> we want our sons and daughters to know that they are citizens uh, of the most exceptional uh, country in the history of the world, the most exceptional. Uh, there is a Marxist doctrine holding that America is a victim racist nation, declared Donald Trump. And uh, uh, Joe Biden repeated several times, very emotionally, like on some actor, America is back. I repeat, America is back. So America is ready to lead the world. America first. We shouldn't go away from this. Uh, uh, Biden now familiar call for a more unified Western Front against the anti-democratic uh, threats by Russia and China. And uh, I, uh, now I, I cite the um, European um, analysts who uh, answered, yes, yes, well, well, uh, this is uh, well-known style of America. We decide you follow. But the world is different now, and probably Europe would not like follow just because America decided. It's the problem. Um, it's possible to describe the identity of politics and identity policy um, 
probably uh, regarding any country or the most country of the countries of the world, but I choose only uh, several cases. Uh, one of them is Turkish identity because it's the subject of strong interest in the world, especially in the Middle East. Uh, and also I uh, use the uh, points of view and the um, conclusions of both uh, Turkish and Russian uh, analysts. Uh, uh, all of them uh, emphasize the politicizations of the Turkish identity. Uh, they describe the um, history of relationship between Turkey and the Europe European Union, a long, long waiting, a long, long um, uh, process uh, without good positive result for, for Turkey. So after 2010, um, Justice and Development Party drifted away from the European normative order and overblown its claim to represent the Islamic Ottoman heritage, particularly in the region and in the world. Uh, so another kind of identity politics, um, another hierarchy of identity because uh, in the world, both national and probably personal um, identity is not just single identity, it's some multiply identity. There is some hierarchy of identities and it's uh, um, evident uh, regarding national identity. Uh, uh, Erdogan raised the idea of awakening of the text, new Califax. Uh, Caliphate uh, majestic past. So uh, his uh, approach to politics and his style, uh, especially um, not only but especially Western uh, analysts, uh, uh, characterizes Erdogan's empire, empire style, empire uh, politics, uh, empire, empire style of thinking also. Uh, and uh, it's necessary for Erdogan in order to legitimize new Turkey as a leader of Muslim world in the Middle East. Um, I found the, some data on the hierarchy of identities. Uh, before 2010, two, two years ago, just two years ago, oh, sorry, 10 years ago, 10 years ago, uh, the hierarchy was that um, the first place in this hierarchy of identities uh, in Turkey was the uh, Ataturk Turkey. Ataturk Turkey, the memory on Ataturk, uh, the uh, values of Ataturk Turkey. Uh, it was the first. Uh, and then the Muslim identity was even uh, the uh, second or third place. But now Muslim identity is the first place in this hierarchy of identities uh, in Turkey and in Turkish uh, respondents. So, <coughs> And uh, so uh, publishers uh, like to compare um, Erdogan with um, uh, this um, majestic past, uh, and how he likes to sit in this um, empire style uh, chair and how he is uh, very severe uh, severe criticize uh, um, Macron for his some um, uh, words uh, regarding uh, Muslim identity, uh, Muslim world. European, European cases also are very bad. And I would like to um, speak on some of them. The Hungarian world of Viktor Orban. I, cited uh, Victor Orban, his position uh, on the um, collective memory in the Second World War, the role of Hungary during the uh, Second World War. And uh, the most um, uh, strong battle, battle uh, uh, Orban has with 
uh, European Union, European Commission, European Commission very often criticized him, uh, and still criticize him. Uh, European Parliament made uh, several uh, decisions against uh, Viktor Orban, but Viktor Orban just uh, smiled, smiled, has a smile, and no, no, uh, nothing uh, different from his uh, course. Uh, he declares Hungary is one of the most inward looking societies in Europe. And what? So uh, he compares the situation in Hungary with the situations in, in other European countries. And uh, he, uh, his mind is that day by the day we see the great European countries and nations losing their countries little by little from district to district and from city to city. The situation in that those who not house migration as their bodies are lost, slowly but surely they are consumed. External forces and international powers want to force all this upon us. Um, uh, Victor Orban defends the right of Hungary to be uh, special uh, not to follow uh, even if European Commission decide we don't follow uh, these decisions because we are very different because we, we keep our uh, Christian world our Christian civilization is the world of uh, Victor Orban and his supporters um, understand, uh, uh, understanding and uh, describing his policy, um, emphasize that uh, trapped in our linguistic and cultural bubble, we Hungarians live cut off from the real enlightened world, and that's why we are so xenophobic and anti Semitic, and why we love our prime minister, who is by law nationalist hate murder. So, uh, uh, the words which could be absolutely awful uh, regarding any political leaders uh, uh, are evaluated like some compliment in respect of Victor Orman. Different, different position, different special Hungarian world, uh, own system of values, Hungarian identity, Hungarian identity of politics, defense of this identity. And um, this identity politics uh, is only one, not the only uh, reason for cooperation of um, Hungarian and po Polish uh, uh, leaders. You look at uh, some satiric um, explanation of their um, Friendship, like uh, right dicta dictators, like right, um, politicians. Anyway, uh, Poland. Poland uh, has some slogan, not official, of course, that uh, this country is the Christ of the nations. Uh, so, also um, Polish politicians um, try to politicize identity, not not just. Christian identity, but Christian Catholic identity. It's necessary for them for the justifications of their policy. You know, you can look uh, on TV how uh, mass protest movements, especially female uh, movements, but not only female, uh, against this abortion law. Uh, uh, which is not human, of course, regarding uh, both women and children, babies, but uh, it's uh, this course is falling into the uh, Catholic um, values, Catholic tradition. And it's why it's uh, um, defended by politicians. The another identity politics component of Poland is anti-Russian syndrome. Anti-Russian syndrome, uh, and it, it is not just in relationship with Russia, but it's more often used in negotiations with European Union. 
that uh, Russia was enemy, Russia still enemy, Russia is danger for Poland. So European Union uh, needs to uh, defend Poland, needs to help Poland. And Poland uh, received more than uh, any other country of the uh, Eastern Europe since enlargement of 2004. Uh, and uh, this anti-Russian um, syndrome is used uh, by Polish politicians very often and uh, very, it's possible to say, with, with high qualification and experience. Um, Hungary, Hungary and Poland. Hungary and Poland, uh, uh, analysts uh, characterize and put it as uh, two EU schismatics schismatic who uh, not, not um, try to uh, divide Europe, but they try to use this card. They, they try to uh, press on the European Commission to the old Europe in order to receive some dividends, some preferences. And the last attempt was made in December uh, 2020 when uh, during the discussion on the seventh year plan, a fi financial budget of European Union. <clears throat> uh, if you speak uh, on Poland, uh, Poland also have some pragmatic orientation towards the USA. Uh, sometimes uh, it's some like not divorce with the EU, but some uh, kind of um, uh, unsincere relations with European Union, American orientation, more. One of the most probably complicated question on the identity politics is the problem of identity uh, politics of Russia, of course. And uh, I uh, uh, looked uh, before presentation, uh, several publications of the beginning of the 2000s. And uh, uh, I remember, of course, but, but in some degree, I, I forget some things. And it's, it's uh, difficult to uh, even to believe that it was true uh, regarding the uh, beginning of 2000s. Uh, I found uh, the, the um, article of Igor Sivilov. Uh, he is a very liberal person. He is historian and political scientist. He's professor. Uh, he was a leader of uh, Moscow office of MacArthur Foundation. Uh, and now he lives in Washington. He's professor of Washington University, as far as I remember. And in his uh, article, which was published in 2002, 2002 uh, he uh, wrote, in 2000s, Putin began changing Russia's image from great power and in influential um, a center of a multipolar world to one of European country and full member of the Western community of states. Uh, and I continue the citation. His opponents viewed that the special place of Russia on the global states is predetermined, pred sorry, predetermined by unique Russian identity based on its size nuclear weapons necessitated to protect local borders and the sense of being a great power and the center of distinct civilization. Yeah, I remember, I remember uh, the, because uh, um, Russia uh, had and still, uh, still has identity crisis after um, 1991, uh, after lost to the Soviet Union um, after became Russian Federation because uh, 
what about system of values, what is the purpose, what is the course, what is the way for Russia. And the society was fragmented. The society still be fragmented. We have fragmented political culture. Uh, if follow the terminology of Walter Rosenbaum, the research of political culture, fragmented political culture. Culture. And in, in the beginning, at the beginning of 2000s, Putin uh, followed the course uh, on the uh, European course and uh, cooperation with the Western community of states. And the situation was different, uh, changed uh, in 2007. And Munich speech of Vladimir Putin was shocked for the Western countries. Uh, what did he say? Uh, he said that, said that Russia is a country, citation, Russia is a country with a history that spans more than a thousand years and has practically always used the privilege to carry out on independent foreign policy. We are not going to change this tradition today. What does it mean? Why? Uh, the Western countries uh, were shocked by this uh, speech uh, because it was the same way. Uh, you decide, we follow. We don't follow what you decide. We will decide ourselves. We will, we will choose our own way. And then, yes, um, uh, after this, period after in the second um, time of uh, his presidency, uh, Vladimir Putin followed this point uh, that Russia, uh, Russia, unique Russian identity based on size, nuclear weapons, uh, since we've been a great power and center of distinct civilization. Uh, in his recent uh, speech, he emphasized that the Russia has a special, a unique civilization. Um, as I said, Russia still has no certain domestic identity now. The political culture still be fragmenting. And it's evident when we look on the uh, reaction of the society and any political event, no, no, no unity, no uh, consensus on the big political event. Uh, probably exclude the independent uh, independence of Russia. Nobody in Russia wants to be part of another country. Nobody, no, uh, everybody wants to be the part of independent country. Uh, as a world power, Russia is resistant to external influences. It's able to protect itself and it tries to pursue independent policy. Uh, I follow in this um, point on the Dmitry Trenin, who is a specialist on international um, relations and world policy. And it's his uh, uh, interpretation, what is a world power now? World power is a power which is resistant to external influences. Uh, world power is a power with able, which is able to protect itself. Uh, World power is power which tries to pursue independent policy. So nothing imperialist, nothing um, which is connected with superpower position. But uh, anyway, not not uh, super, but world power. Uh, very interesting uh, analysis uh, was made by uh, son and father Tsiganov. Uh, Pavel Tsiganov, uh, who is father, and Andrei Tsiganov, who is son. They are uh, high qualified specialists on international relations. They are professors. Uh, Pavel Tsiganov is professor of Moscow State University, and Andrei Tsiganov is a professor of uh, University in San Francisco. Um, uh, they, they are brilliant uh, analysts, I think. And they made some analysis of Atlantic Council um, reports. 
uh, and expertise uh, regarding Russia, uh, Russia and USA, Russia and, and China. And their conclusion is a balanced approach to Russia should avoid partisanship and be based on objective and self-critical expertise. And the politically polarizing international transition places an especially high premium on such expertise. And that's right. I listened to a lot from our colleagues uh, that uh, uh, in the last decade, uh, the Western countries and some Department of International Relations and some analytical centers, uh, they were a short of uh, high, uh, high qualified, high premium experts on Russia because Russia became something not very significant. But now when Russia is estimated as a main threat, so uh, the Western countries needs, need, need uh, expertise and need uh, experts. And I, I agree absolutely with uh, Tsiganov that um, uh, high premium expertise is the, some uh, condition of uh, analysis and uh, a good foundation for uh, uh, real and wise policy making. <clears throat> but I would like to uh, finish my presentation, but not so um, not so probably focused on one country or another country, but our world view. Uh, what is securitization? Securitization itself uh, uh, is this trend of world policy. Securitization of identity politi politics reflects the securitization of world policy. But uh, remember that identity is a social construct. It is created by politicians, but not, not only by political leaders. Uh, public intellectuals could participate and participate, sometimes very actively participate in this uh, construct. Uh, for example, this right uh, change, uh, right wing um, course, right wing turn in Hungary, Poland and Russia, uh, were uh, created with assistance, uh, with work by uh, public intellectuals, intellectual centers, some uh, academic magazines, or literary magazines, literary circles. They supported this. Uh, they made some, uh, not necessity, but uh, possibility to for for this right wing turn so but if uh, some people can turn right and other people can help uh, turn left or center or another course uh, but civic activists also are very uh, influential people and you know that uh, the influences now uh, interpreted are interpreted as even people who are influential on social media, uh, social network, and it's a new reality. Um, today's European Euro news uh, devoted uh, a lot of space in their programs on this kind of our reality, social media, social networking, and its influence on our life. Um, Identity is changeable, and politicians, civil activists, public intellectuals, even all of us can uh, make some um, role, play some role uh, in order to change the identity and the identity um, politics. politics. Uh, then one of the trends of our uh, world uh, up to this situation as uh, pursue of justice. Uh, pursue of justice entails humanization. Uh, and so it's possible to look that securitization versus humanization. 
uh, it is not uh, the evident result of this game, uh, of this development. And prediction of world, world development may change. I would like to continue or to, to finish my presentation on this optimistic um, tone. Thank you for your attention.